So good morning, good day, good evening. My name is Martin Wolf, and it is my great honor and pleasure to moderate this session on what is really one of the great revolutions of our time as it applies to money. What is new technology doing to money and particularly to money within the international monetary system? How will it transform our ideas of how the international monetary system works? And I'm delighted to be joined by a very distinguished uh, panel consisting of Kristalina Georgieva, who's of course IMF Managing Director, Benoit Couré, who was a board member of the ECB and is now working as head of the BIS Innovation Hub. So the organization of central banks at the core of all this. And finally, Ishwa Prasad, professor at Cornell University, uh, senior fellow at Brookings and a former staff member of the IMF, who's just written a big book on this very topic. So let's start, if, I, if we can, with a trying to understand the nature of this revolution as it applies to the international monetary system. And since you've just written the book on it, Ishwa, um, why don't you tell us? Thank you, Martin. Financial innovation and revolutions in the nature of money are, of course, something nothing new. Mm -hmm. But we are now at a transformative moment, I think, where the new technologies are really fundamentally changing the nature of money. Mm -hmm. Of course, decentralized cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin have gotten a great deal of attention. But what I think is going to be the legacy of these cryptocurrencies is not so much their ability to serve as mediums of exchange, which was their ostensible purpose, but really the technology that I think is stirring up a lot of action in terms of payment systems, but also in terms of central banks themselves upping their game by introducing digital versions of their currencies. I see, Martin, a bifurcation of the roles of money coming up with private payment providers, perhaps decentralized cryptocurrencies, but more likely centralized cryptocurrencies, including stable coins, mm -hmm. fulfilling what I think is a fundamental need out there in economies for better, low cost, and more efficient digital payment systems that are easily available to the masses, um, and that can also provide more efficient channels for international payments. So as payments, I think we will have private currencies potentially playing a more important role. But I think other forms of currencies, especially central bank issued digital currencies, are likely to retain their roles as stores of value. There I do not see a fundamental challenge, but there are going to be some important transformations even in terms of CBDCs. Digital forms of money open up possibilities that physical currencies cannot, um, but that will mean much more of a burden on central banks to maintain their integrity, because ultimately what is crucial for the ability of any money to serve as a medium of exchange or store of value is faith. And I think maintaining that faith in central banks to their ability to preserve the value of money is really going to be the crucial determinant in this competition among currencies. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. That's a very good overview of some of the issues. So Kristalina, if I may, um, perhaps you could elaborate on how you see it, and particularly from your vantage point in the IMF, what does it mean for the international monetary system for money to go digital mm. in these ways? What remains the same and what changes? Mm. Uh, wonderful to be on this panel and to have you as the moderator, Martin. We used to say before the pandemic, the future is digital. And with the pandemic, the future has arrived and it also has arrived when it comes down to money. What we see uh, from the fund is both the opportunities of digitalization and also the risks. In terms of opportunities, we can have currencies used for international exchange moving much faster and uh, allowing for the uh, capital flow management to be different, hopefully in a way that benefits uh, uh, the global economy. We can see the configuration of reserve currencies changing. And that may be a good thing if as a result of this change, we have a multipolar international monetary system that is safer, more resilient as a result. 
but we may also may see troubling developments like uh, uh, reserve holdings being subject to cyber attacks. Countries with weak institutions uh, seeing m currency substitution on a much bigger scale. Even today, we know in, in weak countries, 50% of what account holders have in the, uh, in the um, uh, about one-fifth of the countries that are weak, they are in foreign currency. That currency substitution may accelerate and then countries may lose control over their monetary policy. So when we look into this digital today, presence, not even future, what we concentrate at the fund are three levels. Number one, central bank digital currencies. To our greatest surprise, when we surveyed the membership, we found out that 110 countries already today have some engagement on this topic from just exploring what it is to the Bahamas that issued their uh, sand dollar, the first uh, uh, CBDC <laughs> in the world. And that interest we have to take to heart we have to work with the BIS, with others, to, to, to be clear what is the future of CBDCs. Secondly, and uh, uh, we, we heard about privately issued uh, digital money, stable coins, e-money, that is already picking up. We see, for example, M-Pesa making a huge difference in Kenya. Uh, and, that, and there, this is a good development because the private sector steps forward. And then, of course, we have crypto assets, which at the fund, we are not sure we can quite call money. You can use it as money, but you know, you can use this pen as money. They're more an investment opportunity. So to finish on that first round, there is a very rapid development and it requires institutions like the IMF, like BIS, and BIS is doing a fantastic job to move quickly to prevent two things from happening. One, fragmentation. We need interoperability. And two, lack of regulation that means we are going to be, uh, you know, we would be where we are and we would be stuck with what we have and it may not be good for the international monetary system. So thank you very much. Again, very comprehensive and thought provoking. So finally, Benoit, you, you're working on this very much from the point of view of central banks and obviously central bank digital currencies, which have already been mentioned. So how do you at the BAS view this and how do you think central banks should view this, both uh, the challenge and the opportunity and where do you think it will go? So thank, thank you, Martin. That's, that's a very good question to ask because you, you see so much going on in the private sector, in the industry, and Eshwar has spoken to it. Uh, the crypt crypto world is booming, uh, stable coins are knocking at the door. Um, decentralized finance more broadly is, uh, is, uh, is, on a fast, uh, is on a fast growth path. And so you, you, might, you, may, you might wonder why, why would central banks want to join that party? Uh, it's, it's already happening without us. And so the answer, I guess, is twofold. Uh, the first answer is uh, central banks do have a mandate. They have a, a mandate, they have a responsibility to society, which is uh, about monetary stability and it's about financial stability. And we just want to be sure that we can continue to deliver on it in a world that is changing very fast and in a world that is getting digital. And so that might uh, include uh, being able to issue money and to, uh, to uh, distribute money uh, on-chain uh, on, uh, on a decentralized infrastructure. Uh, that might imply being able to continue providing citizens with retail uh, central bank money in a world where citizens aren't using banknotes any longer. Mm -hmm. And that's really the case in many countries. And so it's just about you know, continuing to do exactly the same, uh, exactly what society expects from us, which is uh, financial stability and, uh, and monetary stability, uh, but uh, with different means and with different instruments. And, and part of it uh, uh, will be uh, the, uh, the issuance of uh, 
wholesale CBDC, so that is central bank digital currency that can be used uh, between banks and between the central bank and banks in the, uh, in the inner core of the system uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be used in the, in the plumbing of the global financial system. And that might also include retail CBDC, that is uh, money issued by the central bank uh, that can reach the pockets of citizens. And when I say pockets, it's actually going to be wallets, uh, uh, probably on, on, uh, on smartphones and the like. Mm -hmm. Maybe my, my last point here is um, be careful of the, 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 um, the comparable, uh, the, uh, the alternate scenario is not what you have today. And so lots of people might wonder, why do we need central bank digital currency? We have very good payment systems. We can pay using our mobile phones. So why would you need uh, uh, central banks to do that? Well, the answer is, if we don't do that, uh, the, the market might come to be dominated by very big players, big tech players, with a lot of uh, uh, market power, uh, with a lot of ability to control data, uh, with a lot of ability to, to create world gardens, world gardens meaning uh, liquidity and money uh, being fragmented. And, um, and that's not something we want to see uh, because we want money to be, uh, to be single. We want money to be trusted and to flow throughout the system. So CBDC might be a way to ensure, uh, to, to make happen a system which is, uh, which is open and, and competitive uh, and when, when it, where any new entrant can, can come. So in CBDC can support competition and support innovation uh, uh, instead of having uh, big uh, players locking in their market power, which is a very, a very possible scenario. Yeah, well, that's again very important that you raise so many questions. But I'd like to come back to Ishwa on one issue, which I think is quite a central one, and it's not quite at the international side, uh, but it links up with what the other two of you said. And that is, you referred to the development of private money um, and, uh, and the implications of the creation of private money. And what I'm going to ask you is, well, in what way is this new? Um, in the late 19th century, arguably the greatest of all monetary econ economists, Knut Vixell, pointed out that basically all the money we people were then using were private yeah. bank deposits created by bank lending. These were the product of private institutions. And for most of us, the money we have are what we have in our bank accounts. And that's true everywhere. And it's true also when we transfer money across institutions. So what is really different about the private money we might have, and I think that will link very well with the next section, and uh, and the private money we've actually been completely used to for a, well over a century? You're absolutely right, Martin, that in terms of the money that fuels economic activity, consumption, investment, and so on in modern economies, most of that money creation is by banking systems rather than by uh, governments. If you think about government-issued money, and we go back to the long arc of history, of course, most of the initial forms of money were issued by private uh, agents, either institutions, traders, money lenders, and so on. Then government started getting into the game and there was a period of competition between these monies. And then we had central banks essentially making it very difficult um, for non-bank institutions to start creating their own money. So now we are back to an era of competition at some level. And one might argue as economists that competition is a good thing so long as it doesn't spill over into financial stability considerations. But the point you raise, Martin, raises another set of issues altogether. I think the new financial technologies more broadly, not just in terms of cryptocurrencies and so on, but the sort of decentralized finance uh, movements that uh, Benoit talked about, um, could essentially end up in a situation where the current banking system gets either fragmented, as Christina mentioned, or in fact faces such competition from non-traditional financial intermediaries that it does not have the uh, sort of um, prevalence that it does in modern economies anymore. So that brings up a whole host of questions about who it is that is going to be responsible for creating credit in modern economies. These are questions we're going to have to grapple with. One thing that is certain is that central banks don't want to be in the position of credit creators. I think as we think about CBDCs, the risk that we might have CBDC, uh, CBDC accounts essentially supplanting uh, commercial banking institutions, I, I think is a potentially dangerous one um, that would leave governments playing a much more intrusive role in financial and economic systems, which nobody wants. So these are issues we're going to have to grapple with. I don't have clear answers. Yeah. I wanted to ask you this question because I th that's exactly where I thought you might end up. 
and it and it sharpens what has been said by uh, Christina and Benoit in the sense that, well, if central banks create these um, their own digital money, what's left mm. for the rest of the monetary system? I mean, that's a pretty big deal. And he himself, uh, and I'm, mm. I'm going to get come to Benoit in the game. Uh, Benoit himself referred to the possibility that it wouldn't just be wholesale money; it might be retail money. Um, mm. Many people might feel I'd rather have central bank retail money than, I don't know, my own bank's retail money because it's safer. So that leads me then to the next section. And I'm going to start with you, Kristalina, which is just sort of overview. Um, uh, the opportunities and the perils here, particularly, I suppose, because you talked about quite a few of them. Substitution, currency substitution. We've just been talking about central bank substitution for um, for de deposit money, but also, of course, uh, the, the substitution of private digital monies for um, national monies. So look at the opportunities and the perils. What, what should we see as the really big opportunity here and what should we see as the really big dangers? Well, the, the really big opportunities is that there are three. One, we get technology to step forward both on the public sector side, central banks functions, and on the private sector side by creating a much more efficient system in which central bank digital currencies and privately issued uh, stable coins or e-money can collaborate. Uh, wh what, what is the central bank doing? It is providing finality. It is the final settlement and it provides interoperability so private money can be trusted. And that, is, that continues to be necessary. With the um, um, stable coins, they are backed by assets. They are convertible in, in uh, uh, say, US dollars or other national currencies. And all this is going to be done on platforms, provided we have good, well-regulated reg, well uh, uh, private money, and provided we have interoperability globally for CBDCs that does not require time. It is instantaneous. And it is still final settlement. It still does the stability that our economies require. That is a huge opportunity. Second big opportunity. We can imagine a world in which regional uh, bank, well, back in the original bank that brings the uh, reserves, digital reserves, of members and allows for better reserve provision for a whole set of co countries. And when I think about the future, for small countries, that may be a fantastic opportunity to become stronger and more resilient on that basis. And three, when we think about uh, cross-border payments, which are today still expensive, slow, that is going to be, already we see it, and it's gonna be a completely different world. What are the risks? I want to start again with technology. Well, if you live in a place where there is no internet uh, connection. There is no electricity. There is no way that you can be part of this new world of digital money. What do you do? You are excluded because of the digital divide. So we can only imagine this, these opportunities captured if at the same time we overcome this digital divide. Secondly, there has to be a regulatory uh, environment in place and, and I, I don't know about Benoit, but I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night thinking this has to be happening now. How, to, how can we step uh, forward? And then institutional capacity. If you are a country with weak institutions, today you have currency substitution as a result. How do you establish interest rates, monetary policy, if you are on the back foot in this uh, revolution? And could we then see actually even less ability of citizens to trust their own governments uh, as a result? 
And three, I want to go to the uh, question of a speed of development. What if we are in a world where some parts, private and public, move much faster, and then they define how it should operate? And then we have many of our members being on the receiving end of developments they have not contributed uh, to. And of course, cyber risk is hanging over our <laughs> heads all the time. So Benoit, um, how do you see the opportunities and the risks? And one, I've already mentioned one, the, the relationship between central bank digital currency and the traditional private uh, monies. But another one, which I think is particularly important, is that interesting to me, but there may be others, is that so suppose you have out there this digital euro and digital dollar, which are, you know, which are essentially liabilities of the central, the two great central banks, the Fed and the ECB, which are li liquid. Uh, obviously, they're in digital form, incredibly convenient. How do small countries with their own currencies dissuade their people from really going all in on this most efficient, imaginable way of dollarizing or euroizing their economies, which is what I think Kristalina was just talking about. And essentially, mm. monetary policy disappears. So um, these are lots of questions to, to unpack. So <laughs> let, 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 me, let, me, uh, let me first start by uh, emphasizing uh, what uh, both, uh, both uh, Kristalina and Eshwar have said, which is that um, we want the system to remain d diverse. Uh, we want c commercial money to stay. So there is no hidden agenda by central banks to take over the monetary system and you know, crowd out commercial money because that would be bad for efficiency because innovation fundamentally does come from the private sector. Uh, and uh, presumably it would be bad, for, uh, it would be bad for, uh, for stability and maybe also politically because we don't want central banks to uh, start you know, providing all credit to the private sector. So we need commercial money to stay, we need innovation to be there. Uh, all, the, um, all what is being achieved today are through decentralized finance, uh, that's something that has to be, that has to be uh, that these are benefits that need to be reaped. Uh, so uh, central banks will have to be Certainly, they have to be forward-leaning and they have to embrace innovation, but they also have to be prudent uh, because they don't want to kill private innovation and they don't want to um, crowd out uh, private finance. And if you want to achieve that, you need to have a, a global view of what's going to happen. And that, that very much uh, speaks to what Kristalina was explaining, that it's not only about crypto and CBDC, uh, it's about the way the system as a system will evolve, which also probably involves uh, the, um, the, the division between bank finance and non-bank finance, that's something Eshwar mentioned. Um, so if you, want to, uh, if you want to start this journey, you need to, you need to know where, where you're heading for. You need to know where you want to head. And uh, that may imply more non-bank finance and less bank finance. Mm -hmm. And then as a central banker, you've got to ask yourself, okay, if that's the future world, should I give access to my balance sheet to non-banks? Uh, uh, how should I regulate them? Uh, how, how, do we access, how do I access data coming from that part of the system, and so on. So it is a broader conversation uh, which, uh, which, is, which has started. Um, it's very much today around stable coins, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it will evolve around uh, uh, different forms of, uh, of innovation in, uh, in, uh, in money. Uh, now, if you ask me about the, about the risk, I think there is one risk which Eshwar mentioned, which is uh, the reach of central banks and of uh, central bank overreach, central bank going too far into um, 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 uh, trying, to, uh, trying to, uh, to control private money. And that's something we have to be careful about. There are cultural challenges for central banks. I mean, inno innovation is not something we, uh, we do very easily. The central banking culture is very much, and I see <laughs> Kristalina laughing, so uh, um, that's probably something you can see from, from the IMF, that central, central banks are very conservative institutions. Uh, we're very much in a no-risk culture. And if we want to experiment with innovation, we need to move to a, uh, to a, um, 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 a uh, fail-forward kind of culture uh, where you, uh, you have the right to experiment and you have the right to fail, which is very much not the central banking culture. So there are cultural issues uh, here. Let me, let me stop there. Yep. <laughs> so these are very profound issues. So Ishwa, what is your view on the opportunities and perils? What we, should we ordinary people um, 
out there feel most excited about in terms of opportunities and what should they be most frightened about in this remarkable transformation? Kristalina and Benoit have deep policy burdens on their shoulders, so they don't sleep well at night, but as a freelancing academic, I tend to sleep a lot better. Um, and I think a lot about the benefits that are potentially out there. I think these technologies really have transformative potential in terms of bringing more people into the financial system, giving businesses and consumers easy access to low-cost digital payments, um, which will certainly be a boon for them, making international payments much more efficient, which is good for exporters and importers, even economic migrants, sending remittances back to their home countries. But certainly all of these benefits do come with some um, cautionary notes attached. Um, one of these issues is about um, what role the government should play. Um, I think certainly the private sector is much better in terms of innovating, but the government has to play an important role in setting up guardrails uh, in terms of making sure there are no negative financial stability implications. And I think these are issues that governments are going to have to cope with. Um, there are more fundamental analytical issues to be dealt with after all. If you have changes in the nature of the financial system, if banks are no longer as important as financial intermediaries, then things like monetary policy implementation and transmission and Benu already alluded to this, become much more complicated. Um, how does the lender of last resort function work when you have non-banks becoming much bigger players in the financial system? Uh, so these are a complicated set of issues to deal with. But even if, when it comes to central bank digital currencies, you know, digital money opens up possibilities that cash does not have. We've lived through very perilous economic circumstances for the last decade and a half and monetary policy makers have reached for an expansive set of tools and certainly other tools like you know, um, expiry dates on money, on uh, perhaps thinking about the negative interest rates, all of which become real possibilities with central bank digital currencies um, are useful to have in the toolkit, but they could end up undermining confidence in central bank money. So while these are very good tools for desperate circumstances, um, I think one has to worry about the possibilities of digital money essentially undercutting confidence in central bank money. And on the international dimension, Martin, I think this is a really existential uh, crisis moment for many small open economies and low income countries that have mm -hmm. currencies that are not very credible, central banks that are not very credible. If you have digital versions of the dollar, the renminbi being easily available around the world, or even a Facebook-backed stable coin such as Diem that is easily accessible around the world, those currencies are going to be much more trusted than the domestic currencies of central banks. So central banks have two options here, either to go out and approach this in an active way, uh, where they try to harness these technologies in a way that allows them to maintain control of their monetary systems, but also their payment systems, or be very passive, which could end up quite badly for certain countries. Mm. Now. We're now going to move into a last uh, segment on what is to be done now, as it were, um, to um, uh, take advantage of the opportunities and, uh, uh, and minimize the risks. Uh, there's one issue which I think was, uh, which I would like one of you perhaps to address. Kristalina sort of suggested, I mean, one of the really big issues, obviously, in finance is making sure that the financial system is not, as it were, a veil over, uh, uh, or perhaps a, a rabbit hole down which um, all sorts of criminal and worse than criminal uh, elements can disappear. We, we work very hard to act against money laundering and other criminal uh, activities. Many people are very frightened that in different ways the new digital currency mm -hmm. world, uh, already with crypto, uh, will, allow, will make this problem vastly worse. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we don't want the system presumably to be so transparent that nobody has any privacy anymore. So that seems to me one set of concerns which you haven't addressed so much, which maybe you would want to address in this last segment when we think about, well, what do we do next? So let me start with you, Benoit, if I may, again, turning to um, the digital currency 
world from the central bank's point of view, what they should be doing and creating. You gave some possibilities in your earlier discussion, wholesale money, which seems a rather modest revolution, or retail money, which seems rather a big one. But if you look at it from the central bank point of view, presumably you don't want to be too much focused on the technical aspects of their digital currency, that's very important, but also the crucial overview of the whole monetary system that all this stuff is going to create. So what do you think the priorities for central banks are? So, um, yes, Martin, I agree that technology is not the main uh, discussion to be had. I mean, we, we need to look into it. Of course, we, uh, we do look into it uh, a lot at, uh, at the BIS, I'm sure at the IMF as well. Uh, but it's a little bit the tail that wags the dog. I mean, the uh, decision of uh, having your CBDC based on accounts or tokens, I mean, that's something you can decide only when you, uh, when you figure out what you want to achieve uh, and what are the key policy trade-offs. Uh, so fully agree with that. Um, you know, for me, the, uh, for me, the key word is really collaboration. Uh, because it's a new venture, it's a new, um, it's a new set of issues. Uh, they are deeply interrelated, different set of issues. Collaboration has to start at home. Um, and it starts with collaboration between the monetary authority and the fiscal authority, because we've discussed what uh, digital can bring to monetary policy, but uh, digital currencies can bring a lot to fiscal policy. I mean, they can help channel money faster and in a, in a cheaper way to, uh, to those in need. Uh, in our, I mean, look at the COVID crisis and how some countries have been very efficient at, uh, at shipping money to, uh, uh, to, to households and some have been less efficient. They had to send checks and the banks were closed because of lockdowns and I'm not giving names here, uh, while some developing economies were actually much more efficient. So you, you, see, you see the impact on our possible impact on fiscal policy. Uh, you would need collaboration between different uh, authorities uh, particularly uh, when it comes to retail digital currency, you will need very effective collaboration between central banks and privacy authorities um, and, um, uh, and compliance authorities. I mean, you mentioned anti-money laundering and uh, uh, combat combating terrorism. If you want to design your retail CBDC architecture, you will need effective collaboration uh, uh, on privacy and on uh, AML CFT. So that's, that's really a, a top priority. And finally, you need international collaboration. You need cross-border collaboration. Because if you want to achieve what, uh, what uh, Kristalina has, uh, has described earlier, you need CBDCs to be interconnected. You need them to be interoperable. And you can do it in different ways. You can use standards. You can, use, um, you can have access to different platforms. You can have single platforms dealing with uh, multiple CBDCs. And these are all options that you should we should look uh, uh, into in depth and we should compare the pros and cons of the different options. And that can only be achieved through uh, international uh, co collaboration. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think the uh, uh, international collaboration is key. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, it includes very effective collaboration uh, between uh, the IMF and the BIS, which we do have. Can I push that last point a little and then before we go on? Let's suppose that most central banks end up by issuing these things. They basically do it to solve their own technical problems and they do it in their own way, as it were. Is there a possibility that we will end up with a vast raft of CBDCs, um, well over 100, say, and they don't actually interoperate at all, or at least very, very little? And, uh, and that wouldn't improve things at all. So it seems to me, as a non-technical expert, that it sort of has to be done together to some mm -hmm. degree. If the opportunities you're giving, you're stressing, are actually to be exploited, particularly the opportunity to make cross-border payments radically more efficient. Um, and that's a high, that's an extraordinarily high level of cooperation that would be required. Is that plausible, Benoit? Yes, I fully agree. I mean, uh, Fragmentation is a risk that we just can't take. Uh, but guess what? It's happening. It's happening. So uh, in the BIS Innovation Hub, we have a project, uh, the so-called MCBDC Bridge in Hong Kong, where we are working with four central banks to build a platform to exchange CBDC. And it works. Uh, and we've been able to cut the number of the settlement time from a number of days when you use correspondent banking to a few seconds. Uh, and to cut the, the cost by half. So it's happening. We do have the prototypes uh, and it's, uh, it's moving fast. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very positive about it. But 
and, and sorry to, to throw a very big thing in the, in the, in the, in the conversation, uh, if you want to see that effective collaboration uh, between central banks, you need to overcome technological barriers and you may need to overcome political barriers. The world is increasingly fragmented uh, along technological lines. Technology is part of the competition between nations and you don't want the fate of the global financial system to be hostage of that kind of competition. Yeah. That might be rather optimistic, but uh, we can perhaps come back to that. Uh, maybe Kristalina would like to comment on that later. Um, uh, Ishwak, if I could return to you, um, what is your view of the things they should concentrate on? We've here focused very much because of the participants, I suppose, on central bank digital currencies, but we haven't talked very much about the details of the interaction with private currencies. And a lot of us, I'm, I'm one of them, are really pretty scared of what cryptocurrencies can do to the uh, monetary system. So where do you think the, the, the development and management of the interaction between these various systems as different forms of international payment, where should we be going to bring that together? Um, and should we actually be thinking, as obviously the Chinese government has been thinking, of banning some of this stuff? So, uh, Martin, that is a big question, a two and a half trillion dollar question, of course, if you look yes. just at the uh, capitalization of uh, cryptocurrencies put together, not to mention crypto related uh, um, assets. Um, the fundamental question, again, is whether there are ways that we can use cryptocurrencies and other forms of private currencies to generate more efficient payment mechanisms. So if we can manage to do that without creating financial stability risks, then it is certainly something that I should think a government or regulator to be, should be open to. And stable coins, whose value is supposed to be backed up by reserves of fiat currencies, um, are supposed to fulfill that function, although I would note the irony there that cryptocurrencies were supposed to get us away from uh, domination of finance by government uh, or other traditional financial institutions, but they seem to get their legitimacy uh, from a veneer of sort, uh, some degree of government support. Um, but I think there too there are significant financial stability risks if they don't come under the regulatory um, umbrella. So for governments and regulators, this is going to be a very difficult issue, how to manage the issue of innovation, because ultimately the private sector is good at innovating, uh, but at the same time putting in place guardrails to manage not just financial stability, but also data sorts of issues. And I think the examples of China and India are really pertinent to this discussion. Uh, in China, the regulatory approach was better payment systems are needed. Let's let the private sector do this. And what we ended up with, and both Kristalina and Beno have um, alluded to this, we ended up with a system where you do have very low cost digital payments that are basically reducing the use of money, but you now have very difficult entry because of domination by two key players who now have access to a lot of data and if you think about the Chinese central bank issuing a central bank digital currency, which is now undertaking trials of the idea is to get control of the payment systems and to allow for easier entry. India, I think, has taken a more enlightened approach that bridges this divide in a much more efficient way. The first rail, of course, to what is called the India stack is the identity rail, whereby through a biometric identification um, a process, virtually everybody in the country, including the illiterate, the poor, the uh, rural people, all get access to an identity mechanism. And then a payment rail where the payment infrastructure is provided by the government, but on top of which private payment providers can innovate. So this is exactly the role the government should play, making sure that there is relatively easy entry uh, and no domination by the key players. Um, but you do have private sector innovation being permitted. But I think the third rail is really the most interesting one, the data rail, where essentially the government is going to make sure that there are data aggregators who can pull this data together and give consumers, households, whose data it is, the ability to decide who gets to see that data and who gets to uh, manage that data. I think that is going to be something that every country is going to have to deal with, not just as an economic or technocratic issue, but really at the level of societies. Because as you pointed out, CBDCs may bring a lot of benefits, but it is going to potentially mean a loss of privacy. So technology creates a lot of wonderful solutions, but I think relying on technology 
to solve all these problems is going to be um, a path too far. Governments are going to have to play an active role, uh, but one that is not too intrusive. Mm -hmm. yep. I think by now, after 25 years of the internet, we have realized that many great and wonderful innovations have quite significant downsides and we wish we understood them before we started. And in the case of money, that the downsides could be really bad. So that leaves me to you, Kristalina. What do you think the next steps have to be to make this revolution work? And what is the role of the IMF in ensuring that we get the best and minimize the worst? Uh, because if it really does go badly wrong, obviously people will not easily forgive you. Well, the different types of digital money require different priority to make them work. When we talk about central bank digital currencies, the priority ought to be integration. Because if we go in the direction of different technological platforms, different functionality, lack of interoperability, then we are contributing to fragmenting the global economy, fragmenting our world. So there, the, the, the ability to work together and what Benoit said about bringing different CBDCs for the purpose of interoperability is hugely important. When we talk about uh, stable coin or, or, or privately issued money, the priority focus has to be on regulation because if they are unregulated, uh, then we are risking to see um, what, you, what you started from, a um, small number of tech uh, giants dominating the world. We might see problems of inclusion, despite of the fact that the big advantage of digital money is they allow people to be included in the world economy whenever they are. And that concentration is hugely important if we are to see a world in which there is public trust in privately issued money. They innovate, but they innovate within parameters uh, that are uh, thoughtfully and well-defined. And then we need to have traceability. And that is the huge problem to wrestle with how to protect privacy and at the same time not allow criminal activities to flourish on the back of digital money. Uh, the Indian example is indeed very uh, interesting because it brings another aspect of digitalization, which is digital ID. I personally am a big believer we need that. If the world is going to be digital, we have to accept that we have that digital identity but it does bring lots of problems around uh, privacy and human rights. And let me say, as somebody who uh, grew up in, in a communist society, that does make me take a pause. How to, how to make sure that the world is inclusive, democratic, that we push back on criminal activities, uh, and at the same time, there is traceability of uh, actions. So digital money don't end up being just another way to have a suitcase with cash to pay for a criminal activity. Uh, so complicated in a way, but also not, not that complicated when you clearly identify what are the key problems to be solved and then bring the uh, tech industry, the private sector, uh, central banks, the International Monetary Fund for us to work together to solve these problems. And one last point that I, I would be interested actually uh, to have more conversation on that, but it would be interesting to see also what is the influence of different existing systems on what takes an upper hand. If you have a country where capital markets are very developed, would that mean that private digital money are a more attractive uh, alternative versus a, a country where the banking sector is very, very developed and therefore there may be more attractiveness of central bank digital currencies. Uh, but I think, uh, Martin, we will park this question for you to bring us again uh, to discuss it. So this is the end and I think the 
the main conclusions I've drawn here are the revolution is going to happen, like it or not. So we to try to be in control of it. And the second big one is a really interesting conundrum I haven't thought about so much, but comes out very, very clearly, which is different countries have to experiment. There can't be a single model uh, because we will learn from the experiments. At the same time, they have to experiment in ways that still preserves the idea of a more efficient international monetary system. So integration has to go along with, with differentiation and experimentation. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought about this so much, just of course, as the private sector development has to go along with and, and, and support in some ways the wider social interest that the state is responsible for. I think we are at the beginning of something very profound and transformative. It's been a wonderful discussion. I've learned a lot and thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, and Ushwar, and uh, Benoit. Thank you.